we uh, are pleased to have Jeannie um, from B Pothecary uh, to discuss with us tonight um, the health benefits and all the great things about pollen and propolis. Really glad to have uh, Jeannie with us tonight and uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Okay, well, we're going to go on to a, a little different take here and um, if I can get myself organized, maybe we can do this. Uh, I am Jeannie Som. Um, I'm a retired school teacher and we got our bees in 2010 or my husband got his bees in 2010 and I was not interested. I told him from the get-go, this was not going to be my project <laughs> and um, I didn't want to be a part of it. I had too much to do and I just didn't need one more thing to do, but I kind of started feeling left out when our friends and he started going off to meetings and dinners and eating out. And so I suddenly decided I had to go with him. Um, but we did get very interested in high products um, and ended up starting a, a small business um, using that or making value added products of the hive in 2013. And we just have a passion for propolis. So I'm going to share that with you first tonight and tell you um, what the research says about it and all the different things that you can do with it and encourage you if you're not already to be saving your propolis. I know it's something we all hate, <laughs> but um, it really is quite valuable. And as um, Mel indicated, it is really used almost all over the world and purchased in the pharmacy right next to pharmaceuticals as a health product. So um, we in North America really need to get on board here and know what everybody else in the world knows about propolis. Propolis is the, the uh, resin from the trees. Uh, we used to think that it had um, B enzymes and so forth in it, but according to some of the researchers lately that have been doing work with propolis, it, it had, does not have B enzymes in it. It is simply the raw resin from the trees. So the bees collect it from the bark where it's oozing out or from the blossoms and they bring it back to the hive because this substance is antibiotic, antiviral and antifungal. For the trees, it keeps the trees from getting illnesses so that they can bloom and um, does the same thing in the beehive. Once they bring it into the hive, it does get mixed with some of the beeswax as we know kind of everything in the hive mixes together. Um, and there's a little bit of everything in each item from the hive. But when they first bring it in, it is purely uh, balsam or resin from typically balsams and evergreens. It's important both to the bees and for us because it has all kinds of um, important ingredients in it, amino acids and essential oils. But most importantly, the flavonoids and the phenolic acids are the items that this researchers are finding are what are very medicinally active. It protects the beehive and it disinfects it, disinfects it that you, we know they fill it up in all the little cracks and crevices. They also use it to basically embalm intruders. If a mouse doesn't, does get into the hive in the wintertime and it's still a live hive, the bees will sting the mouse to death. But then they're stuck with a dead body in the hive that they can't get rid of. So they actually, um, instead of allowing it to decay, they coat it in propolis and it, it embalms it so that it doesn't decay inside that coating. We can trace the use of propolis in literature back to the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Romans. The ancient Egyptians actually used to be propolis for embalming. It's very likely that the pharaohs in the pyramids may have been embalmed with bee propolis. And this background picture shows you beekeeping was very important in their culture. And a lot of their artwork and carvings are about beekeeping. The ancient Romans used propolis as a tonic for battle and also on wounds when they came back from battle. And you can find it all through folk medicine literature, but it kind of fell out of favor a bit um, in, I'm sorry, in the Middle Ages. Um, but kind of came back to importance in the, during the Renaissance. And then in our modern times, in the 1900s, and especially since World War II, there has been an incredible amount of research done on propolis all over the world. And it, our GIs, uh, when they were serving in Europe during World War II, actually used propolis. They called it Russian penicillin. Today, there's worldwide use of propolis as a natural medicine. It's actually bought in pharmacies all over Europe and Japan, China, in South America, Mexico, 
in the pharmacies right next to all the pharmaceuticals. They don't have the, the same limitations um, in the law that we have in North America. Um, 70 plus of year, years of research you can find, um, and I'm going to give you some, some uh, resources here shortly. The research on propolis has shown that it is antibiotic. It kills staph, strep, all the gram-negative bacteria, um, MRSA, E. coli, salmonella. One of the research pieces they're doing right now is to try it out as a salad green wash for grocery store salad greens. It's also antiviral, uh, so it kills viruses like GI tract viruses. Um, it's antiviral and it kills um, things like GI viruses, wart virus, shingles virus. There's a human study that was done on shingles showing that it's actually better on shingles rash than the prescription ointment that they typically used. It's also antifungal, so it kills athlete's foot and yeast infections. If it's taken internally, it's antioxidant, so it works kind of like CoQ10 does, gathering those um, single oxygen molecules called free radicals that run around your body and destroy tissue and things. Uh, it's kind of part of the, the um, beginning of the disease process. So propolis can help with that and has a lot of organ protective qualities. It's also anti-inflammatory inside and outside your body. It reduces swelling and redness and irritation. Um, and it's also analgesic, which means that it is uh, pain relieving. So it works uh, internally and externally to relieve pain. If you go to the National Institute of Health, it's NIH.gov, you can find research on over 85 different conditions and illnesses um, that propolis has been researched on. And I've made a chart that is available on one of our websites that I'll share with you later. Um, but you can look these up and read the research for yourself. One of the things that I have found in, in really digging into the studies that are, um, that are all there, sometimes all you get is an abstract. I have found that for systemic illnesses and organ protection and pain, they are using 900 to 1500 milligrams of propolis orally per day. But for the microbial action of um, killing staph strep and MRSA and, and fixing damaged skin, wounds, incisions, burns, uh, rashes, and things like that, they're only using two to four milligrams of propolis, which is very easy and very doable for us and um, doesn't use very much propolis. These are some of the human studies that have been done with propolis. They've done research on acne, eczema, psoriasis, shingles, wound healing, and I've got some fabulous information to show you on that. The rhinovirus common cold, it's shown to reduce the common cold by two and a half times versus untreated. It's been tested on ear infections and upper respiratory infections in both adults and children down to two. Um, the most amazing study that I've seen, and we have actually seen some results from this, is that women with uh, endometriosis infertility can increase their chances of pregnancy from 20 to 60% if they take a thousand milligrams of propolis a day. Um, we met an OBGYN beekeeper that practices here in Columbus, Ohio, who started sending some of his patients to us and had patients getting pregnant with that uh, treatment. Um, it also kills athlete's foot. I've had human studies on that and also urinary tract infections. So um, there's not just the lab studies, as, as sometimes there is, but also on animals and, and human beings. Here are some research links that you may want to jot down. Um, I will post this uh, presentation on our business website so that you can refer to it later. Um, if you give me a couple of days after today, I'll get it up there. But NIH.gov is one of the best places. There's just hundreds of thousands of pieces of research. The one thing I'll caution you is this. Their search engine doesn't work as well as Google does. So if I want to know about propolis and kidney disease, and I put in propolis and kidney, kidney disease, it won't pull up as much as if you do it outside NIH on Google. So what I do is I Google it, you know, do it on do the search on Google, and then look for the NIH uh, internet addresses for the articles that come up, and then go back into NIH. It just shows more for some reason there. Uh, AP Therapy Blogspot is a place that you can go and sign up for about a twice a week email that sends you one piece of research about anything having to do with AP Therapy. AP, AP Therapy is about everything that's in the hive, including bee venom. 
And um, they will send you one or two articles a week of just some of the recent research to kind of keep keep you updated on what's new in AP therapy. There's the abtherapy.org organization that is the, um, I think it's just the U.S. organization for AP therapy, but there is good information there. And um, at our bpothecary.wordpress.com, it's our blog site, we do post some links to research and I've sorted some of it into human studies, animal studies, and petri dish studies so that you can look at, at some of the different things that they've done research on. From our personal experience, when we first started reading about this, I, we started collecting just little bits of propolis as we inspected our hives. And one day, our adult daughter, who is a severe asthmatic and has life-threatening allergies, um, left the house one morning with a sore throat. And she came back about three o'clock and she had complete laryngitis and it was starting to settle into her chest. And she's a terrible asthmatic. So the minute she gets a cough, a sniffle, a sneeze, it ends up in an asthma attack in about five hours. And within about five days, she has bronchitis or pneumonia. And of course, at this point in time, she had a new job, no health care, and couldn't afford to call off work. So I thought, you know, I'm going to get that propolis out and make up propolis oil, which I had read about doing. And you can do it in about 20 minutes because you have to use heat to do the oil. So I made some up and I had her take a half a dropper full three times on Saturday and then three times on Sunday. And she rested all weekend. And by Monday morning, she had no symptoms and she never had the asthma attack at all. And of course, didn't develop on into bronchitis and pneumonia. So we decided there might be something there, passed it on to our dear friends that we're in business with now. Um, Peter had had um, a walking pneumonia and had, a, had taken a round of z -Pack. His symptoms went away, and then we went camping two weeks later, and he coughed all weekend and kept the whole campground awake. And I passed that bottle of propolis oil onto him and said, try this and see what happens. And he took doses, three doses for two days, and all symptoms were gone. So we started trying it, using it, passing it around to family members and such. I really needed something for sinus. Um, as a school teacher, I would have sinus infections all winter long. And um, we just, I tried the oil in my nose one time and I would advise you to never do that because it's very painful. Um, we know that, you know, even just water burns your nose. So if you can imagine having oil sitting on your nasal passages and burning, it was awful. But we now are mixing a mild saline with a little bit of propolis tincture, which is alcohol based. And um, that works like a charm to shrink the swelling of the nasal passages all the way up into your sinuses and kind of just flush out all the congestion. I use it at night before I go to bed because um, the drip starts the minute I, I lay down in bed. It's also great for ear infections. The neat thing about the ear infections, if you put the drops right in the ear, it numbs almost instantly. Um, if you have a child that you know, has that middle of the night screaming ear infection, we went through that many times with our son um, and had to run him to the emergency room. If we'd have had this, we wouldn't have had to do that. It's also great for mouth sores, canker sores, gum infections. It is the one thing that our government will actually um, say that it's useful for on some of the government health sites and so forth. But it does work to, to make those go away and also numbs them at the same time. Topically, um, you can use a propolis oil or, or, or even the, the tincture or creams um, to get rid of blemishes, shingles, poison ivy. I'm a person that used to have to have 20 days of steroids to get rid of poison ivy, and it went systemic, and I would just blow up all over. And now if I catch it right away and start putting propolis on it, I can get rid of it in five days. It'll take away eczema, rashes, acne, inflammation, and joint pain. Now, my husband and I do not get pain relief from arthritic hands or elbows or shoulders with topical application. We use bee stings instead, but some people do. And we have had people, you know, walk up to a table at a festival and rub some of our sample oil on their arthritic hands. And while they're standing there talking to us, they get pain relief. So it's just, you know, like everything else, it's different for everyone. We um, have used it on age spots to get them to lighten up, you know, heal sun damage. I, I had, I've been using this uh, propolis cream that we make and suddenly realized that the 25 or 30 skin tags I had had all around my neck that were just driving me crazy, catching on clothing and necklaces were gone. And I didn't realize it until, you know, they had completely disappeared. And that's from the propolis. 
um, wounds and scars. The healing is just phenomenal. Um, diabetic ulcers, and I will be able to show you some pictures here shortly that will just be amazing. We also use it on our pets and farm animals, and there actually is research that you can find at NIH on uh, pets, on farm animals, you know, pigs and cows and horses and all kinds of things. Um, we put it in their ears for ear infections, and it will treat either a bacterial infection or that fungal infection that they sometimes get. It's the heavy white uh, lumpy um, discharge in their ears. Oh, excuse me. Um, this picture on the right are two pictures that a young couple sent us. They got they bought some propolis oil to use on their chickens who were pecking each other down to the bone. And they had to send us their before and after pictures to show us how well it, it worked. Um, but we also use it on our pets' hot spots. If they have something systemic going on, we put it in their food. So it does work as well on animals. Um, these are some of the products that we make with the propolis. Um, and we take it a couple of different ways. We take it preventatively if we have, if, you know, somebody that has systemic illness or chronic illness. My husband is an asthmatic smoker, and yes, he's still smoking. Um, he's my he's my uh, example to give you. He uh, typically, for probably 15 years, had bronchitis or pneumonia about six times every winter, and he um, started taking propolis, a half of a dropper full every day. And he started out with the 10% that we make. And within in nine years now of him taking propolis every day, he has had bronchitis two times in nine years instead of six times every winter. He has in, um, moved up to taking our 30% uh, tincture that we make for the women with endometriosis. And he is now taking a teaspoon of that to bring him up to that thousand milligram level uh, every day but um, he is doing quite well considering that he has COPD and asthma and is still smoking. Um, most of us take it orally only when we feel like we're getting sick. Sore throat, scratchy throat, runny nose, sneezing, and we will take a half of a dropper full three times a day. And typically, and we have four generations of two families using this, and typically whatever is going on will disappear within two days, whether it's ears, throat, nose, that kind of thing. Um, it, it really is just quite phenomenal. Um, I ran across, as we were kind of researching all of this, this fabulous study that was done by a, a doctor in Poland in 1972. And when I read through the whole thing, I was just appalled that we didn't know anything about this and why weren't we using this in this country. Um, he decided to try propolis on poor and chronic non-healing wounds. So he started out with 100 patients that had about seven different kinds of wounds, and the entire research study is there. It will tell you where they found the propolis, how they uh, harvested it, how they uh, cleaned it, how they infused it into alcohol or whatever, how strong they made the ointments, how many times they debrided wounds. It's quite amazing. And these are some of the most benign pictures to show you. Some of them are really quite horrific. This top one is a baby who uh, has an electrical burn. I don't know how that happens. But the thing that I notice is like there's no scar on the cheek on the after picture. Um, same thing with the fingers. You can't even tell the fingers were burned in the second picture. So um, really quite amazing, um, you know, photographs of the before and after. And he's got quite a few on there and some of them are awful. The thing that um, I wanted to share with you, this is a lot of information to look at, but I just wanted to kind of show you what it is. In the first, this came out of his study. In the first column, we have the type of wounds. So we had all different kinds, burns, leg ulcers that like the diabetics get that go way down deep through the, the layers of skin, bed sores, osteomyelitis, which is a deep bone infection, infection, infected wounds or um, infected operative wounds. And then he, he has the number of people, how long the illnesses last, once you look at this one, 30, some of these people had these leg ulcers for 30 years unhealed. Then he tells how many wounds had complete healing and how many had significant improvement. If we put those two together, I added a column over here for success. Then the, this, this middle column in the middle is the failures. So in the burns, he had 100% healing on, on all of those. He had 90% of these deep tissue ulcers some of them that had been there for 30 years. He had 80% of the bed sores. The only one that came that fell below that was the osteomyelitis bone infection. And my daughter, who's a nurse, says that is very, very difficult to get 
uh, cleared up because it's deep in the bone, very hard to get the medicine to it, even with uh, pharmaceutical medicines. 100% of the uh, injury, the wounds from trauma or from surgery were healed, which I just think is phenomenal. And why don't we know about this <laughs> on this continent? It's just terrible that we don't. So we decided that we wanted to start um, saving our own wound pictures. So if you don't like to look at wounds, don't look for a few minutes and I'll let you know when it's safe. The first one isn't too bad. Um, this came from a friend of uh, Pete and Lori Dodson's who had had elbow surgery. And his, this, his wound, it, it was like two inches long across his elbow. And he, it's now 30 days, or I'm sorry, two months old, 60 days old, and it will not heal. And it's still kind of weeping. So he can't go back to work and he's using all his sick leave. So Lori sent him a tube of the bee rescue cream that we make that has two and a half percent propolis in it. And he used it every day, a couple times a day. And in five days, he got this wound post up so he could go back to work. He sent us another picture at the end. This is what it looked like a month later. And he said he even continued to use it on that scar and actually got rid of the scar, which we have seen happen in other cases as well. Now, the next one is a little more gruesome, but it's really kind of amazing. This is a lawnmower accident. My daughter had been doing some home health care with a paraplegic and had used the bee rescue cream on his seven-year-old dinner plate size bed sore. She went on to a new job. And dad decided that, or dad called her a couple months later and wanted more. And she went over there to drop it off, thinking that it was for the son. She gets there and he shows her that he, in fact, he, he's an older man and diabetic, has fallen over his running lawnmower. And it's now three weeks old. And it looks like this. He's had stitches at the emergency room. And my daughter saw it and just said, Larry, that is infected and turning gangrenous. You're going to lose your leg if you don't get to the hospital. Well, he refuses to go. I'm going to use this bee cream. So his wife put it on twice a day and took a picture for us every day on every Wednesday for about 10 weeks. And this is what it looked like one week later. If you notice, even the skin around it, that's that typical diabetic skin looks better. My daughter said this middle section is not infection left. That's actually called sloth. And it's the soft scab forming coming up underneath. And then this is the last picture she sent us. This is um, 10 weeks later. It looked like this. So quite a dramatic um, healing of this wound with B propolis at two and a half percent. We started getting pictures from customers showing us eczema just overnight, getting better with propolis cream. This young lady, this is kind of a cute story. She and her mom had come by our booth two years ago in the fall, and she was asking about something for acne. She was heading off to college, and I'm never quite sure what to tell uh, young people about what product to use because I don't know if the oil is part of the issue. I always felt when I was a teenager, the oiliness of my skin made the acne or the blemishes worse or whether they should use tincture, which would be very drying because it's alcohol. So we talked about it and she decided to take three things with her to college. She took the propolis oil to take daily orally to heal from the inside out. And then she used the other two topically. She had a routine going and she would get up in the morning and wash her face. And then she would put tincture on the spots, which at, at the beginning was all over really her face. And then at night, she would put the bee rescue cream on, which is a base of um, coconut, no, shea butter and olive oil and the, the uh, propolis oil and beeswax. So she put that on at night. Well, they came back to visit us at the same festival a year later just to visit us and show us her face and to get more product and to show us how beautiful her face had, was and how much it had cleared up. So we were really tickled with that to see that. Um, just of interest, um, in the last year or two, I have found several pieces of research on coronavirus saying that propolis kills coronavirus at 75%, which is equal to some of the um, pharmaceuticals that they're pushing out now. Um, however, they will not let us post this or advertise this. We put the, the um, uh, website on our, our Facebook page and instantly got in trouble. We've also had um, a couple of people have success with cancer tumors. They are killing cancer cells in a Petri dish of about 50 different kinds of cancer. But how that would ever, you know, translate to treatment is unknown at this point. But these two people had tumors that they could actually reach and use the propolis on them a couple of times a day. And both people 
got into the guy with the, the rectal tumor. The doctor had seen it on the, the uh, scan two weeks before the surgery, went in to take it out and it was gone. And he just was flabbergasted. And the other gentleman had a tumor in his jaw and it had uh, gotten into his gum as an infection and used it in his mouth to clear up this infection and the entire tumor disappeared and he never had to have the disfiguring surgery that he thought he was going to have to have. If you want to collect propolis, and I would recommend that you do, you can collect propolis as you as you uh, inspect your hives. Now, we don't want to take propolis away from the bees if they're using it for a reason. You know, they, they put it in all the cracks and crevices and put it on the walls and such. So we're just taking the propolis that's in our way or the propolis that we've trapped. The one thing they don't tell you about a propolis trap is that you have to take your inner cover off, put the propolis trap on, and then block the lid up. Now, I don't block mine up that far. I just put a stick under it, uh, you know, just a, a stick laying down so the, the lid is up maybe only an inch. Um, the idea of this plastic propolis trap is that the bees fill it, and then you take it off, and you put it in a, in a big garbage bag in the freezer, and the propolis gets very brittle as it's frozen, and you're supposed to be able to just wiggle the, the plastic trap, and it's all going to fall off in that garbage bag. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't work that well. That uh, rigid um, propolis trap is, is very rigid, and it doesn't want to really bend and let loose of this. So you spend a lot of time uh, with your hive tool or a steak knife picking all of this propolis out. So we've come up with some other ways. Needlepoint canvas that is three-eighths of an inch or smaller will collect propolis or even hardware cloth or screen. If it's any bigger than three eighths, they'll put beeswax in it and that's not what you want. So, and you can just lay those pieces right on top of the, the hive, uh, the top hive box. The other thing that we do is put thumbtacks, just flat regular thumbtacks on the rims of the boxes. And then when you put the next box on top, it brings that box up just a, a teeny, teeny crack and before your next inspection, the bees will have filled that crack in with propolis. So as you're inspecting and taking boxes off, you can just zip that bead of propolis off the box all the way around and collect that. Um, you collect during inspections, scrape away what's in your way, put it in a baggie and put it in the freezer. And the reason you do that is because it does have all kinds of things from the hive in it and it will mold if it's not clean. So do put it in the freezer and I'll tell you a little bit about what to do with it after that. We also collect during the winter time when we're cleaning our equipment. I get a, a telescoping cover upside down over a tarp and sit out on the front porch or, or in the garage and scrape and again put it in a baggie. Uh, but all of these things, you know, all the way around the, the lip of the boxes, and in between the boxes is propolis and the cracks of the walls, there's propolis. Um, it, it's just, you know, there's quite a bit there. And the one question that people ask is, how do you tell if it's propolis or beeswax? Well, what I tell people is, if it's starting to be made into a hexagonal shape, it's beeswax. Now, both beeswax and propolis are kind of mixed together in the hive. But when you're infusing propolis, for health purposes, you don't want to think you're infusing propolis and really be infusing beeswax. So that's why it's important to kind of be able to tell the difference. If you look at some of these um, spots here, the dark um, kind of amber colored spots are probably propolis. And then on this right box, all of this stuff that's stuck down in the ledge here is propolis. The other thing you can do is chew a piece and just see what it, you can tell the difference in the texture. You know, be beeswax is kind of falls apart in your mouth. Well, propolis is really sticky. And um, don't chew it too much because it turns your teeth orange and it doesn't go away very fast. So saving and storage, we tell people always freeze it in baggies. And the reason is if, if you put it in a container that has a shape and a different size hole at the top, we got propolis from a, a provider one time and the, he sent it to us in big nut jars from Sam's Club and, you know, square jar, round hole. Well, the propolis in the jar got warm and it all melted together in a big cube and I couldn't get it out of the out of the jar. So I had to cut the jar off with a hacksaw. So save it in baggies um, until you have enough that you want to work with enough to make, you know, propolis for your family. If you want, it is viable for a long, long time, even unfrozen. And you can check the pro potency of it and find out if it's still viable and active by putting a teaspoon in a cup of milk and sitting it on the counter for four days. And if the milk does not spoil, then the propolis is still viable and active, killing all those microbes in the milk. 
and then you'll know it's still good. Now, there's not enough time tonight to talk to you about how to clean it, but you do want to clean it and separate it out from the beeswax before you use it. So if you go to our bepothecary.wordpress.com website and look for the presentation on propolis, there are you know pictures and how-tos about how to clean your propolis. You basically do it outside with in cold water. The propolis floats, I'm sorry, the propolis sinks and the beeswax and the dirt and the bee parts and the grass and all of that stuff floats to the top. So you kind of separate it like that. Now, look at what you can do with propolis. You can, you can actually grind a propolis in a coffee grinder if it's very frozen. You don't want to let it thaw or you will have a mess. Um, there is actually um, propolis toothpaste that you can find at Trader Joe's. It's their house brand of toothpaste. You can put pro ground propolis in capsules. You can infuse it in oil, in alcohol, in glycerin, in water, in other extract extraction methods um, for health purposes, for skin care. You can put propolis oil or tincture in a product recipe. You know what we do is substitute pro some of the propolis, some of the oil in the recipe with propolis oil to make it a certain percentage. So we've put it in um, aftershave, hot lather shaving soap, in uh, creams at different amounts for different purposes. You can buy uh, this Garnier Whole Blends shampoo that has propolis and honey in it. You can make your own wood varnish with propolis. You can make your own leather cleaner or, um, you know, leather furniture treatment or uh, floor wax, all kinds of things that you can do with propolis and honey and beeswax. Um, I'm going to show you really quickly how to make it. You know, we think that every beekeeper out there should be making their own for their family's health because it really is an amazing product. You can make propolis tincture, which is by definition made in alcohol. That's what tincture is. You can make propolis tincture up to 50% by weight, as long as you use 75 proof or better. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be the cheapest vodka on the shelf you can find, or you can use your finest bourbon if you really want to. Um, but we, we make it 10% because we know that the research on germs um, and, and uh, wound healing is is 2.5 to 4% on the studies. So we make a 10% um, just to be safe. And so, but if you wanted to make a 5%, it would be one part out, um, propolis and 19 parts alcohol by weight. So we weigh the propolis and the alcohol. We put the propolis, and we've learned to do this. We put the propolis in a mesh bag. It can be a little decorative mesh bag. It can be a little cheesecloth bag. But if you put it in the bag, then it won't stick to the bottom of the jar and never come out again. So you put it in a jar big enough. We typically like to use these large two-quart mason jars and shake it up and set it in a dark, cool, dark place. And you're supposed to then shake it daily um, and shake it up, mix it up, and then um, let it sit for three weeks. Now, the way you test it is if it makes your tongue numb, they say, then it's ready. Now, it will, it will get darker and darker. It will not all dissolve. There will be residue in the bottom. Um, and so you'll take that if you either have to strain it or you have to, if you pull out, put it in a mesh bag, you just pull that out. And you really should put it in a dark bottle. But if you don't want to mess with that, just leave your jar in a dark place so that it, the sunlight isn't going to damage the effectiveness of it. Um, now, to make infused oil very quickly, you have to use heat and you cannot make infused oil any stronger than 10% because it isn't as good a solvent as the alcohol is. Um, so kind of the same process, you weigh the oil, you weigh the, the, oil, uh, the propolis and you know weigh, make it one to 10% and then put it in a jar in a pot and put the jar in a pot on the stove. And you're going to fill that with water. Now, here's the tricky part. If you're using your kitchen stove, it's really hard to bring it up to a certain temperature and hold it there, whether you've got an electric stove or a gas stove. So we have tried a couple of different things that make it that a little easier. We invested in an induction burner that actually has a thermostat on it that you can set. So And you, you don't want to heat it more than 120 degrees. So we put the jars and we use a big canning pot that will work on an induction burner. We put our jars in, we fill the water above the line of the oil in the jars because you want to heat all the oil, not just the bottom two inches. And then put a thermometer in the water, heat the water up to 120 degrees and hold for 20 minutes. 
We turn our jars over, make sure the lids are on real tight, but we turn the jars over halfway through just to kind of mix up the oil, make sure it's all getting heated. And then you just remove the jars, let them cool. And if you want to strain them, you can put them in the dark bottles. Now, the other way that you can do this, if you happen to have a large fry daddy, the fry daddy is my favorite uh, tool for working with B products or B high products because it has a thermostat. I do not use a crock pot for heating beeswax or melting beeswax. First of all, it takes too long. Second of all, it gets too hot eventually. The, even with the lid off on low, your crock pot will start, your beeswax in the crock pot will start to smoke. And that means it's being overheated. If you use a fry daddy, you can put your propolis and alcohol or pro, I'm sorry, propolis and oil in a smaller jar, like a jelly jar. And then that will fit in the, um, Fry Daddy, and I, I wouldn't use the basket. Just set the jars down in there, bring the water level up above them, and set it to 120 and hold it for 20 minutes once it gets there. Now, I do want to let you know about what your laws in Canada say about dietary supplements. But the propolis oil and tincture, if used orally, is classified as a dietary supplement. And um, just like in the US, um, there are lots of hoops that you have to jump through. We can make anything we want for our families, but if you're talking, if you're thinking about trying to sell it, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. You have to have a manufacturer and distributor license. You have to get your products licensed, and you have to apply for the license and use these reference monographs of different natural health products to prove that yours is just like such and such, and it's safe and effective. You have to use good manufacturing processes, which are all explained online. They're kind of a, a generic, uh, probably an international code, but it's, you know, using a disinfectant to wash everything down and wash all your tools and wash all your containers and using a hairnet and a beard net and gloves and uh, an apron and cleaning your surfaces, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then in your country, you have this neat little claim that you can make. That if you if you are referencing knowledge, skills, and practices based on theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to a specific culture or based on an ancient practice of medicine. So you kind of you all have kind of a little loophole where we do not, we in the US, we cannot put anything on the product that really tells what it does. We can't use medicine words, we can't make claims, nothing. So it's really hard to kind of market your propolis products when you can't tell people on the label or in advertising what it does. Um, now, if, if you're going to put propolis in cosmetics, pr uh, skin creams, bath, you know, bath uh, bombs or whatever, lip balm, that kind of thing, that's considered a cosmetic. And now and I don't know where soap sits in your country. I didn't look that one up. And soap in our country has a whole completely different set of laws. But in cosmetics, has to be manufactured, prepared, preserved, packed and stored under sanitary conditions, but it doesn't say you can't do it in your home. Now, this is a label from cookies, but basically, if you notice at the top, it says made in a home kitchen that is not subject to retail food establishment regulations or whatever. So you do have to have some kind of disclaimer on it. You have to list your ingredients with the the one that's the highest amount first down to the smallest. You have to notify Health Canada that you're selling this product. You have to follow the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act in your country. You have to check the ingredients because if you're using dyes or certain chemicals in skin creams or makeup type stuff, um, you have to check for the Environmental Protection Act to look and see that some of those things might be banned in skincare. And you have to use, again, the good manufacturing pra practices. So that that's kind of what you're up against if um, you want to make these things or you just fly under the radar and don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so moving on to pollen so that I can stay within our timeline here. Pollen is another thing that is incredible for not only the bees health, but ours. Um, it is, of course, the male seed of the flowers and it's food for the young bees. It's their protein source. It's actually 40% protein. They say that pollen has more protein by weight than a steak. Now you'd have to eat an awful lot of protein to equal a steak, but it is full of protein and all kinds of other nutrients, just about every mineral and vitamin on the planet. Um, it actually takes 2 million pollen grains from a flower to make the pollen pellet that the bees kind of mush together to bring back to the hive. That's a lot of pollen. Now, here's what the research says about pollen. You're going to be surprised at one of the things it doesn't say. 
It does show that it helps regulate intestines. So for uh, digestion issues, it's good. It, it increases the white blood cells and hemoglobin in your blood, normalizes cholesterol and triglycerides. It also medicinally inhibits harmful bacteria and they actually use it as an adjunct treatment to chemotherapy along with propolis um, in other countries. It shows delayed or prevented cancer tumors and cancerous tumors in mice. Now, the one thing that the research does not support is a remedy for hay fever and allergies, nor honey. Um, you know, there is there are millions of anecdotal stories about people using honey and pollen for hay fever. However, if you think about how that should work, the idea is that the honey or the pollen or both work like an allergy shot. And so you start taking it several weeks, I think six weeks is recommended, before that season that you're allergic to. So for instance, if you're allergic to ragweed, that, that blooms when goldenrod does in the fall. So if you take honey and, and pollen, you should take that before the fall. Well, the problem is, first of all, pollen is not graded or regulated as to what season it was harvested in or where. So you have no idea what that pollen is from. And if it's not from ragweed, it's not going to do any good. The other thing is spring or summer honey would not have any ragweed pollen in it because it wasn't harvested during the ragweed season. So technically, if, if it worked the way we think it does, you would need last fall's honey or pollen that you know you collected from a time when ragweed was blooming. So it gets a little fuzzy there. And as I said, they've not been able to replicate that information or that claim with research, which is interesting. To harvest pollen, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, we started with this bottom drawer that is actually an extra piece that you put on below your entrance. And um, it, it, you, it does have a drawer that you pull out the back, so you don't have to actually take it off to, to harvest the pollen. They are making these new traps that just fit over the front entrance. What the pollen traps do is make the bees go through this little sort of a maze. The ones I've looked at have coils of wire in the entrance. So the bees have to go through this coil of wire that gets smaller and smaller, and it kind of strips the pollen off of their bodies. Now, it doesn't take all of it, but it does take a lot of it. Um, so we have to remember that when we're taking things from bees, whether it's honey or propolis or pollen or beeswax, when we take it from them, then they have to make more. So if we're taking pollen from the bees, then they have to send their foragers out to get more pollen for them. And so maybe they're not going to have as many bees making honey at that time. So it's always a trade-off. Um, there are some recommendations that you only collect pollen from strong hives during a pollen flow not from weak hives. And there, there are different recommendations I've seen, two days to a week, then off. Some people say two days and then off for a week. Some people say you can collect it for a week and then off. Now, the tricky part about collecting pollen is that you have to remove it daily. Pollen does not last very long. And if you leave it, sometimes if it's really humid and you leave it two days, it's too long and it's molded already. It mildews real quickly. So you have to get out there every day and take it out and do something with it. Um, you have to bring it in and clean it. And I know only know I only know one way for sure that works, and that's hand picking and tweezers. Because you have to, it's dirty. It has bee parts in it. It has grass. It has wood chips. You name it. And so you have to kind of pick all that out by hand. Some people say that a hair dryer works. I'm I've never tried it, and I'm not sure you can blow grass and bee parts out of the pollen without pollen being airborne too. So I don't know whether that really works or not. So you have to clean it, and then you've got to do something with it. You can refrigerate it in its raw state, and it will last for three to six months, or it might last long enough for you to then do something with it a week or two later, or you can freeze dry it if you have a fancy freeze dryer, or you can dry it yourself. And I'm going to show you a couple ways to do that, or you can freeze it. Now it will last one to two years if it's frozen or dried, but only three to six months in the refrigerator. Now to dry it, you can use a cookie sheet in the oven at a hundred. You can put it in a food dehydrator below a hundred. So you've got to have a food dehydrator that has a thermostat on it. And what you do is you spread it out either on the cookie sheet or on the, the uh, trays that are in your food dehydrator, kind of smooth it out so it's in as, as low a, a 
you know, almost a single layer thick. And you leave it in there until when you go in and pinch it, the pellets don't stick together. They fall back apart. And that's when it's dry enough to seal in a stored container and store. Or seal, seal in, you know, put in a sealed container and store. And it will last one to two years in that form. Now, the one thing, here are some different things you can do with it. You can ground, grind it and use it raw or dried. You can grind it and put it in capsules. You can put it in smoothies, energy snacks, oatmeal, yogurt, skin scrubs. Oh, excuse me. But the one thing you need to know if you want to consume this and get all those health benefits is pollen is very hard coated. And the bees actually, the little the young bees don't can't digest it. And guess what? Neither can we. So what you really need to do is grind it up first or soak it overnight. You know, people that, that have dry pollen in a jar and they take it out in the morning and sprinkle it on their cereal or put it in their yogurt, you're really not going to benefit from that because it's too hard to digest. If you want to make a smoothie with it in the morning, soak it in your milk or, or whatever the night before, or grind it either in a mortar and pestle or with a coffee grinder. It will not grind up in a food processor. So remember that. What the bees do is they layer the pollen and the honey together in the cells. And I've read, that, you know, we always wonder why do they call this bee bread? It's not bread, um, but they say it looks like slices of bread from the side, and it does. Um, but what happens is the honey um, ferments the pollen. There's a chemical reaction that happens between the two, and it breaks down that hard coat on the pollen, and it actually creates a substance that has more nutrients in it at the end than it did at the beginning. And that becomes the food for the young bees because it's now digestible. It also helps um, keep the pollen from ferment, from uh, molding and mildewing it. So it helps preserve the pollen, and it's especially important for there to be bee bread in the, in the cells for the winter so that they have pollen that's not decaying. Um, you can make bee bread outside the hive. So here's another uh, value-added thing you can do with pollen. Um, you can mix together pollen and honey and put it in jars and let it sit. And I'm going to show you on the next screen. But this becomes a high-energy nutritional supplement. Um, for people that want more energy or that, excuse me, the, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Want the um, health benefits from the honey and the pollen. Um, as an athlete or as, as somebody that wants a little more energy, we use this when we're working out in the yard in the summertime. This gives you, um, a, a one ounce of it is 100 calories, uh, two, uh, 20, 21 carbs, I can't see my screen here, 21 carbs and one gram of protein. Now, we have friends that are athletes, um, uh, crossfitters and and uh, marathoners that use bee, re bee um, bread as a, sub a substitute for the energy gels that runners and athletes use. You know, those are made with high fructose corn syrup and caffeine. And I've always wondered why athletes who train all year and eat healthy and exercise use that awful stuff on the day of their race. So this becomes a, a much better substance to use. We have a friend that runs 100 mile ultra marathons and he puts four ounces of bee bread in his water bottle and shakes it up with his water and uses that on his race. And he said, you don't get the highs and the crashes like you do with the energy gels that runners and athletes use. Like I said, we use it when uh, we're working outside in the yard. We have friends that keep a bottle in their desk or at work and they take a squirt in their mouth at two o'clock in the afternoon when they start nodding off after lunch. Um, we have a lady that told us she travels for work and she keeps the bottle in her glove box in her car. And when she starts nodding off at the wheel, she um, takes a, a tablespoon or so. And what we find is that in about 10 minutes, you suddenly don't realize that you're having to hold your eye, eye, eyelids up with toothpicks, but you don't have that jittery feeling like you do if you drink caffeine instead. Here's how you make it. Now, you can make it any ratio you want. It can be one to one. That would be very thick. One to two, one to four. You can put the pollen in just like it is. You can put dried pollen in. You can put ground up pollen in. It's up to you. If you want some recipes, FAO.org, which I'm going to tell you about at the end, is a great place to find recipes. Now, my only concern with what they suggest is that they suggest adding water to the mix. And I don't think that's a good idea. You know, honey is the only food that doesn't spoil, but if it gets water in it, it will. Uh, they also recommend adding probiotics, which probably is a replacement for the bee 
enzymes that would be in the, the bee bread from the hive. But you put it in jars, mix it well, put it in a cool, dark place. You can put it in the refrigerator if you want to. And in two to six weeks, it will all kind of be consistently the same texture. What I, we do is flip it over every day or so to keep it mixing. The pollen tends to float to the top. And so you want to keep turning the jar to mix it. And then ways to use it, you can put it in your coffee or tea in the morning. You can put it on your toast. Um, you can put it over ice cream. You can put it in smoothies or, you know, if you make those energy bars with um, the peanut butter and honey and all the nuts and seeds and things like that, uh, you can put it in that. As I said, you can use it for an afternoon pick-me-up or before, during, or after workouts. So that's another great um, value-added product that you can make from the hive. Now, I just want to here at the end kind of give you some resources. These were the three books that kind of got me going on all of these resources from the hive. This Honey Revolution book is is fabulous. It's very it's very long and it's very technical about the medicinal. Uh, per, uh, benefits of honey and what it actually does in your body and how it interacts with all the different organs in your digestive system. There is a, an abridged version that's maybe 100 pages long if you don't want to do that much reading. And then these two little books I found on, on Amazon um, at the very beginning of our research on all of this before I found NIH. And this was really the only information I could find at first about propolis. So it was um, hard to find at that time. And of course, then NIH.gov, which you can just read research till the cows come home and never read it all. Um, and that's a great resource. The other place I would encourage you to go is this. FAO.org is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And whether how you feel about the United Nations or not doesn't matter. This book is fabulous. It's an online uh, publication. It's about 200 pages long, and it tells you about every single hive resource from what it's made of, its chemical components, how the bees make it, what the bees do with it, what you can do with it, how you can, and what the market, you know, is, is um, as far as selling it or making products from it. And then it tells you all the different value added products that you can make from that particular hive resource. And it even gives you recipes. So, and if you're not familiar with this word value added product, that's an agriculture word that they use to describe um, things, raw materials that you take from nature that you do something to, to make it different and have more value when you sell it. So, um, you know, instead of selling raw propolis, we make a propolis oil and tincture, and then we that gives value to the product. If you make applesauce from apples, or, uh, you know, apple pie from apples. That's a value added product. So this is just a fabulous resource. And it just tells you everything you ever wanted to know about every resource in the hive and all the benefits it has. And I think as beekeepers, it's important for us to know what the value of our resources is. You know, that helps us sell our products if we're into, if, if that's what we're doing with our beehives. So I, that is it.